Welcome back everyone. In this lecture we're going to continue our look at the history of the correctional system. Specifically we're going to shift to focusing on modern day America, the United States of America. During the 1600s and 1700s, as European colonists made their way to North America, they brought with them a lot of the ideas and traditions and approaches that they had had in Europe. Um, along with those, obviously, they brought a lot of the same philosophies and approaches to punishment and the correctional system. But once America broke ties with England and became its own country, one of the things we start to know is they start to introduce some uniquely American philosophies to the approaches of punishments and corrections. Um, and namely, one of the first sort of what we call sort of the models or philosophies of corrections that we saw is what is often referred to as the penitentiary model. And that's going to be our main focus for this particular lecture. So we're going to talk a little bit about what is the penitentiary model, when did it start in America, who were some of the big players that contributed to it, and then we're going to take a little closer look at two of our, our earliest and most um, prominent versions of that penitentiary model, one being Eastern Penitentiary in Pennsylvania, and the second being Auburn Prison in New York. Uh, the readings that correspond with this are chapters two and three from your course textbook. So let's go ahead and get started. In our previous lecture, we talked about sort of the rise of the use of prisons and incarceration in Western Europe. Um, now, those ideas of incarceration made their way to the United States. Um, in the late 1700s, uh, the United States of America was a new nation. And within that nation, there was one group that really sort of was at the, the part of the social elite, um, and those were the Quakers. And the Quakers' religious views and ideals felt that in order to have somebody properly be healed and go through the process of punishment, they were big believers in concepts like penance um, and quiet self-reflection, quiet self-contemplation. And they believe that those are ideas that should be part of the correctional system. Now in Philadelphia, um, Pennsylvania, late 1700s, uh, the Quakers formed a particular group called the Society for Alleviating the Miseries of Public Prisoners. Okay, kind of a mouthful, but you get the idea. So this Society for Alleviating the Miseries of Public Prisoners, as the name suggests, one of their main focus was getting rid of sort of like public punishment, corporal punishment, um, these sort of harsh forms of punishment that we had seen in Europe. And now one of these leaders within this group was Benjamin Rush. And Benjamin Rush um, was a major contributor to the growth of sort of the penitentiary approach in America. And what is the penitentiary? How did it come to America? Well, the first, arguably the first penitentiary in America was in, at Walnut Street Jail in Philadelphia. And what they did was they took a multiple story jail in downtown Philadelphia and they broke it apart into individual cells. And the spirit of it was that individuals would spend their punishment, spend their days in these, cell, these cells in isolation by themselves. Why in isolation? Why by themselves? Well, because that was sort of the Quaker ideal of being left alone for self-reflection, um, to think of penance, and as far as to sort of like face your own sins as a hope to sort of get through that. And that idea in and of itself, this sort of like self-isolation, this idea of pot potentially having an aspect to the Bible, um, things of that nature, hard work, we'll come to that in a moment, sort of created the foundation of this penitentiary model here in America. As the penitentiary um, approach and the philosophy behind it really started to take off in America, one thing that was quickly realized was that places like Walnut Street Jail just didn't have the capacity to house a large number of inmates, especially in their own cells or in isolation. Um, and in fact, Walnut Street Jail soon became overcrowded, which sort of went completely against the idea of the penitentiary approach of having each inmate in their own cell for self-reflection and to be alone. So what we started to see in the early 1800s was America started to build prisons. And this was sort of the beginning of the prison boom that continues to today in America. And the two earliest 
penitentiaries or classic models of the penitentiary were Eastern Penitentiary um, in Cherry Hill, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia, and then Auburn Prison in New York. Now, when we look at these, and that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at today, is what was it about these two different facilities that made them unique? Um, what was sort of the backbone that has stuck with us today um, as far as our approach to incarceration and punishment? Um, and we see a lot of the, the ideas that were put forth back in the early 1800s are still part of our correctional system today. So even though Auburn Prison was opened a little bit earlier than Eastern Penitentiary, it was really the changes that took place in the 1820s that kind of makes Auburn considered the second. So I'm not worried about how we consider it, who's first, who's second. Um, but usually when we go through a historical approach, we think of Eastern Penitentiary, which opened in 1829 as sort of being our first a pure example of uh, the penitentiary model, followed by Auburn Prison. So what make Eastern unique? Well, Eastern Penitentiary was a large scale facility. We're gonna see some photos here in just a second um, where the key focus was that idea of isolation. Each inmate would be housed within their own separate cell. Um, and that was allowed for all these ideas that the Quakers espouse as far as approach uh, the appropriate way for um, punishment. Auburn Prison followed many of those same ideas, and especially under Warden Elam Linz in the late 1820s, where he sort of really started to introduce this penitentiary idea, where you had individuals in isolation and separate confinement, but you also had an idea of like during the day, the way that they might work together and we'll talk about in a moment, usually it was working together in silence. Um, and this became known as sort of the congregate system where inmates would work in sort of workshops during the day, you know, sort of that idea that hard work will lead you in the right direction. Um, idle hands are the ways in which we get in trouble in the first place. And so this notion of the congregate system had people working together during the day, but then at night they would return to their own cells. Um, and then within Auburn that also allowed, because you had this congregate system of work during the day, it allowed for them to be able to produce, you know, turn the inmates into laborers. And this introduced this idea of the contract labor system, where pretty much inmates were used, their labor was used to create goods and manufacture things that could be then sold to the public or sold to private industries and it allowed the prison to one, make money, two, to give back to society, three, give inmates something to do while they were there, but also create some issues that we still worry about today as far as whether or not inmates should be sort of, you know, are they truly free to work? Are they being forced? Is their pay adequate? Um, and these are things we could go off in a whole different direction, but I'll kind of leave it right at that for right now. Um, and then whereas, so if Auburn had sort of this congregate system of working together during the day and then isolation at night, Eastern sort of still stuck with that idea of isolation 24 hours a day. And in fact, during the, the first couple decades of Eastern Penitentiary being open, even though inmates were expected to work during the day, oftentimes they were expected to work in their cells. They didn't even want inmates to be around each other. Um, and so Eastern was much more of like isolation 24 seven, whereas Auburn was, work in silence in a congregate fashion during the day, but then be isolated and silence at night. When we look at the design of Eastern Penitentiary, this created sort of the radial design which has influenced, you know, um, prisons around the world, um, not just in the early 1800s, but even up until today. And the philosophy of it was, if you look at this photo, it was what is the most efficient way to house inmates, keep an eye on them, and maintain order without having to staff it with large groups of individuals. So one of the things you see here when you look at this drawing of Eastern Penitentiary is that the outer wall of the prison was a strong fortifying wall to keep people from entering or exiting. Um, you had turrets at the at each corner. Um, so you had a post where you could have staff members be able to watch in case there was attempts at escape or anything along those, those things. 
but perhaps even more importantly is the nature of the bill or the structure of the buildings within that wall. And you'll notice there's like a central hub uh, at, the, at the very center of this Eastern Penitentiary. And what that allowed, you'd have like one area where you could have some, a correctional officer or two that would man that. And then what they could do is they could look down from that central hub out into down those corridors where the cells would exist. So each one of those arms that radiates out from the center, those were the cell blocks. That's where they would house the inmates. Um, and in fact, Eastern in its early stages was two different stories. And so you'd have a row of individual cells on the bottom floor on the left and right side radiating out from the center. And then you'd also have the same thing on the second floor. And this allowed the staff members or the correctional officers to be able to be at the very center of that hub. And they could hear and see any disturbances or any problem just by looking down each one of those sort of radial arms that, that shot out from there. Um, and this idea allowed us to have, be very efficient. You didn't need very many correctional officers to be on staff um, as long as you may watch that outer wall for potential escapes, um, but it also allowed you to fit quite a few people um, and each person in their own individual cell. And this kind of gives you a glimpse. Um, obviously, this is after the prison was closed. Things have deteriorated quite a bit. But in this photo, we can see sort of the view of what it might look as you're looking down one of those long arms, um, that radio, those cell blocks, as they radiate away from that central hub. And so you can imagine if you heard cries or screams or you know whatever else you might hear from the prisoners, or if in case there was some sort of issue going on, you could look all the way down to the end of that cell block. And each individual cell at Eastern Penitentiary was designed for one inmate. Originally, that was the intention. That was the, the backbone of this penitentiary model. Um, so an inmate would have a small place to, to sit, perhaps um, radiator vents for heat, and then a, a light source, whether it was a window, depending on which floor they were on, whether it was a ceiling light source um, for natural light, or if it was on, on the wall but it was a pretty small area um, for this individual. And remember, as I talked about earlier, at Eastern, the idea was isolation pretty much 24 seven for the most part, especially during those early decades. Now, some inmates over the years had access to a little bit fancier uh, material. And as you can see, this is just like the, the picture we saw on the previous slide but they made it a little bit more roomy um, with a little the right accommodations. And in fact, this is sort of a, a recreation of the cell that the famous um, Chicago mobster Al Capone, uh, when he served some time at Eastern Penitentiary um, in the early 1900s. So you can see that if you had access to the right material, you could make it somewhat of a, a decent living situation. And Eastern, along with a lot of its history, has some other colorful characters. It doesn't, not just that it, it housed individuals like Al Capone and many other famous uh, criminals over, over the years, but it also has individuals like Pep the dog here. Um, and the story with Pep goes, there's sort of multiple stories. As you can see from his, his uh, shot here, his mug shot, he doesn't necessarily look too happy. And in fact, he was given a, um, a number. And in fact, the interesting thing is that number C2559 was never used for any other individual or human. One story goes that Pep was um, convicted, I believe it was, of cat murder. Um, I believe he was owned by the governor and the governor's wife's favorite cat ended up dead or maybe it was multiple cats and Pep was charged and convicted of that murder and then sentenced to Eastern Penitentiary. Um, that's one story. The other story is, that, and this also sort of speaks to ideas that we still see in the correctional system today, is some people argue that Pep was actually brought to the prisons to interact with inmates. Um, and once again, this was in the early 1900s. This wasn't, this wasn't way, way back. This was more modern. Um, but that Pep was introduced to the inmates almost as a form of rehabilitation and therapy for somebody for them to interact with and take care of, um, which is still a philosophy and an idea that we see in a lot of correctional settings today. So regardless of the true origin of Pep, 
he was, did spend quite a few years at Eastern Penitentiary um, and has his own um, inmate number. So let's take a look at some interesting facts about Eastern Penitentiary. Now, arguably one of the most important facts for us to take away was the influence that prisons like Eastern particularly, as well as Auburn had on the world. Um, as delegates and, and, and politicians from around the world were sort of you know visiting America and then taking ideas that they had seen back to their home countries, we saw the growth and proliferation of many, many prisons that sort of mimicked and were modeled on the idea of what we saw at Eastern Penitentiary um, with that very large fortifying outer wall, but then inside having sort of that radial hub cell block design that became so popular at Eastern State Penitentiary. And as you can see on the slide, I mean, uh, prisons that were sort of modeled with the same architecture sort of popping up in South America, Europe, Asia, um, et cetera. And now Eastern Penitentiary didn't just stay with his basic design. Over time, there were certain advancements and arguably one of the biggest individuals to um, introduce some of the largest advancement at Eastern Penitentiary was Warden Michael Cassidy, who was warden during the 1870s um, up through the 1890s. And he added cell blocks um, in the 1870s and 1890s in order to handle a larger number of individuals, which goes to show that even when you have those radiating arms, you, there's still, if there's still open space, you can add more cell blocks and just pretty much like having more spokes on a, on a bicycle wheel. Also, one of the things that sort of in a humanitarian effort was Warden Cassidy allowed inmates to start wearing hoods that actually had eye holes cut into them. Um, now, it still may sound a little antiquated to us today, but inmates at Eastern Penitentiary, even though they spent the vast majority of their time in their own cells in isolation, they were occasionally let out to the yard to walk, to get a little bit of fresh air and a little bit of exercise. Now, oftentimes if they were let out there, they were in the early decades, they would have hoods put over their face um, so that they wouldn't be, be able to see other inmates and they may be shackled together in, in a straight line with other inmates and then sort of led around like you know a dog on a leash um, to get a little bit of exercise. Well Warden Cassidy introduced a simple idea of cutting eye holes for the inmates. And this was to sort of remind them a little bit of their, their, you know, their humanity. Um, and even though they weren't allowed to communicate with other inmates, they were at least able to know that they were among other individuals. Um, and so it sort of, it took a step forward as far as, you know, breaking away from the pure isolation approach. And now, even though when I say here that they were allowed to exercise together, this is not the type of exercise that we would imagine on, you know, a prison yard today. Uh, with weights and exercise equipment and basketball hoops and things of that nature. Um, rather, this was more basic walking, you know, running, things of that nature. But once again, it was done in silence. And even with these, these hoods with eye holes, there was a sense of anonymity, which sort of forced the individuals to maintain that original idea of sort of penance and self-reflection. The prison itself closed in 1971, um, and today is actually a, a rather popular tourist attraction just outside of Philadelphia um, in Pennsylvania. Many stories, as you can imagine, if you think about the stories and, and if you were a fly on the wall in that place for the, you know, from 1829 up until 1971, there's um, a lot of claims of hauntings and ghosts and things of that nature. Um, but if you ever get a chance to get out to Pennsylvania and Philadelphia area, I strongly encourage you to try to visit it. One of the things that we also saw about Eastern Penitentiary was it started, to, even though we see the popularity, where we started off this slide talking about the fact that almost all prisons design, blah, 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 follow this model, even in the first couple decades, questions about this sort of philosophy of isolation, this philosophy of anonymity, this philosophy of being left to yourself all the time, were already being questioned. Um, and if you think about it, this is the same questions that we have in a lot of the literature now about the impacts of solitary confinement. 
Um, these are things that have not gone away. There's debates about, you know, at what point is somebody, you know, are we starting to mess with somebody's um, psyche? Are we starting to mess with them mentally by having them in solitary confinement? And this, this that's nothing new. As we'll see on the next two slides, even going back to the 1830s and 1840s, there were already questions about the the efficacy and sort of, you know, um, appropriateness of this type of punishment. One of the delegates to visit uh, Eastern Penitentiary in the mid-1800s was Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, he was a French diplomat. Um, he wrote Democracy in America. You may be familiar with that. And he spent quite a bit of time in America examining our democracy and our democratic system. And when he visited Eastern Penitentiary, he found it to be rather to his liking. Um, he was really impressed with what he saw, as you can see in this quote. Thrown into solitude, the prisoner reflects. Placed alone in view of his crime, he learns to hate it. And if his soul be not yet surfeited with crime and thus have lost all taste for anything better, it is in solitude where remorse will come to assail him. Can there be a combination more powerful for reformation than that of a prison which hands over the prisoner to all the trials of solitude, leads him through reflection to remorse, through religion to hope, makes him industrious by the burden of idleness? Like this is sort of, he's saying, wow, this place is impressive, right? I mean, you can sort of see his, his story of like, seeing the inmate come to Eastern Penitentiary, be left alone in his, his cell where he can have time for reflection. Um, he'll feel, feel that amount of remorse for his crimes and what he has have done, and those will sort of like weigh on him. But then that leads to sort of um, reformation, and then that reflection, he'll become remorseful. Um, he'll find religion, so he'll become hopeful. Um, the fact that he may be expected to do work in his cell um, makes him enjoy the simple value of work because it, it takes away this notion of idleness. All these things that de Tocqueville saw in Eastern Penitentiary was sort of the, the main sort of selling point that, sp that caused this approach to corrections to spread around the world. This idea that we don't need to be punishing people with corporal punishment. We don't need to be whipping them and stoning them and things of that nature. But rather, by just leaving them alone, they will sort of find their own way through their head um, and become a better person. Um, now, that's his take on it, but not everyone necessarily shared the same views. Um, so right around that same time, in those mid-1800s, we saw another individual visit Eastern Penitentiary. Now, Charles Dickens, another individual you may uh, recognize his work, one of the greatest um, English scholars of all time. Charles Dickens was, came to the U.S. and also visited Eastern Penitentiary around this time and had the following to say. In its intention, I am well convinced that it is kind, humane, and meant for reformation. But I am persuaded that those who design the system of prison discipline and those benevolent gentlemen who carry it into execution do not know what it is that they are doing. I hold this slow and daily tampering with the mysteries of the brain to be immeasurably worse than any torture of the body. And because its ghastly signs and tokens are not so palpable to the eye and it extorts few cries that human ears can hear, therefore, I the more denounce it as a secret punishment in which slumbering humanity is not roused up to stay. Now, I don't know about you, but I love this quote. And I think it really speaks to the perception that Charles Dickens had, um, and which was kind of a different point of view than what a lot of the individuals who visited Eastern Penitentiary ever thought about. Whereas you had individuals like de Tocqueville um, and, uh, and other leading scholars and, and of, of the time period looking at it and going, wow, this is great. We don't need to be punishing people in a harsh and harmful way and in a public way. We're keeping the punishment quiet. It really has no true torture to it. But Dickens saw, like peeled back the layers of that onion and really saw that eh, there might be something more going on. Um, things that, he, as I mentioned earlier, that we are even now still trying to understand the impact of solitary confinement on individuals. Um, the impact of having everything that happens in prison 
things take place, you know, behind those walls, out of the public viewpoint with no real sort of transparency, right? He sees this and he recognizes that he believes that the individuals who designed this approach had their best intentions, but that, that line right there, I hold this slow and daily tampering with the mysteries of the brain to be immeasurably worse. That right there, he was ahead of his time and sort of, um, sort of estimating and summarizing and, and figuring out that pain and, and torture sometimes doesn't just come in physical um, torture. And then that idea about it, you know, because it's ghastly signs and tokens are not so palpable to the eye, you know, the fact that we've seen this and as we go through and talk more about issues that have, you know, occurred in our prison system, our correctional system, many things have been hidden from the public's eye. Um, and that me leads oftentimes for us to sort of forget about the plight of those individuals within the, those prisons. And that's what Dickens saw so early on. Finally, we'll wrap this lecture up with just a few um, interesting facts about Auburn Prison. Now, Auburn, as I said, even though it sort of arose and was built and open around the same time as Eastern Penitentiary, Eastern Penitentiary always got more of the, the, the limelight and the focus. Um, but Auburn, in and of itself, was one of our major, you know, preeminent models of this penitentiary style. As I mentioned earlier, it introduced us to not just this idea of like having inmates in solitary confinement all the time, time, but allowing sort of this idea of like the congregate labor system where they would come to workshops and work, although in silence, would work together and therefore were able to be more productive. And that's where also where Auburn was allowed to introduce that idea of the contract labor system, which still to this day also has its, you know, detractors as well as its, you know, the people who like it and the people who hate it. Um, so both of these prisons introduce quite a few of the ideas and philosophies and also introduce many of sort of the, the debates that we still have today. So some interesting facts about Auburn. Uh, the first execution by electric chair in the United States uh, took place at Auburn Prison. Um, 1890, um, a Mr. William Kemmler, and I believe he took like a hatchet or machete to his wife or somebody. So pretty gruesome um, murder, um, but he was the first person who was put to death by the electric chair in the U.S. And as you can see here in just a second, one of the things his let's just say it wasn't exactly what we would call a painless form of execution. Uh, the first 17 second passage of current caused unconsciousness, but didn't stop his heart and breathing. And so then they had to wait for the generator to actually recharge before they could hit him with another um, current. The second attempt hit him with 2000 volts and blood vessels under the skin ruptured and bled and the body caught fire. So one of the things that we also, the debates we still have going today is about the appropriateness of the death penalty. Um, and as we can see, when we talk more about the death penalty in a later lecture, we'll talk about each advancement, each change from the electric chair to, you know, to gas, to lethal injection, to hanging, to fi you know, firing squads, to everything. All the approaches have always been with the intention of making it more humane, less painful, much quicker, um, but all of those have been fraught with many problems. Um, and as we can see with this example of the first attempt by executing somebody via the electric chair. The actual entire execution for Mr. Kemmler took about eight minutes to complete. And Auburn itself is actually still in use. Um, it operates with a capacity of approximately 1,800 um, inmates on any given day. Um, and so even though it is one of the oldest prisons out there, it's still up and running. Um, and similar to what we see um, in California, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next lecture, um, like our oldest prison, San Quentin, is still up and running. Now, whether or not it should be shut down, once again, another debate. So I'm going to wrap up there, but a couple of the things I want you to take away is one, understand sort of this idea of what we call the penitentiary approach or the penitentiary model that were started by Walnut um, Street Jail and Eastern Penitentiary and Auburn Prison. This idea of isolation and hard work and sort of repentance um, that was introduced, but also some of the debates um, that were created and started about sort of the efficacy and appropriateness of these types of punishment that occurred at these types of facilities. All right, so I'll leave it there and I hope you have a good day.